Well, good morning, Story Church. It's great to see y'all. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining us for worship this morning. Whether you're here in the room or uh, joining us online, we're just happy that you're here. But why don't you stand on up, and we're going to worship together this morning. Turn somebody next to you and welcome them to church this morning. Good morning. Y'all can have a seat here a second. My name is Zach, and I serve on the worship and uh, tech team, and I also serve on the story advisory team, as well as the Zero Collective leadership team. And we just want to take a moment here in this service. Uh, as you may be aware or may not be aware, 
today or this month is October. Oh, sorry. This month is October. Uh, is Pastor Appreciation Month here? Uh, and it's so. I think it's very evident just how blessed this church has been by our pastoral staff. And so we just want to take a moment out of our service to celebrate that this morning. So um, one of the things that I just want to highlight here is that on a similar theme throughout the leadership of this church and from the beginning until now is that they all have trusted and learned and leaned into what God has called them into. And it says in Ephesians four, verse 11 through 12. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. And these folks do that um, through sermons, children's ministry, youth ministry, or leading us in worship. So today and this month, we celebrate those leaders in our church. So I'm going to call up these four individuals, Sarah Van Mittendorp, Steve Scudder, Parker Weirda, and Mr. Kyle Cottridge. Uh, Now, we have a special gift for them on behalf of the leadership team here, which consists of Lori Tosh, Erica Chandler, Dave and Kate Dykstra, and myself. And the nice thing is this service, they get to keep their gifts. First service, they didn't get to do that. (laughs) So you guys can actually take them home this time around. Um, But we just want to highlight a couple things about each of these individuals. Um, I'm going to start off with Sarah Van Mittendorp. Uh, Some of you may know Sarah is our children's pastor. Um, And just Sarah, thank you for the way that you serve. Um, Children's ministry is such a vital and uh, a vital part of any church and just you do it so well. Um, In Deuteronomy 6 verse 7, it says, impress the scriptures upon your children and the lesson plans that you craft and the ways that you demonstrate Christ to those kids and the way that you built up your team is such a blessing and a testament and reflects that verse uh, to them. It's really cool to see the kids, um, they come out and they regurgitate those things. They, they keep referring back to those, to those things and just shows how impactful children's ministry is and the work that you are doing. And there's a lot of work that goes in this role, church. It's not just uh, showing up on a Sunday and watching kids. There are lesson plans thought into. There's coordinating volunteers. So there's just a lot that goes into it. And Sarah, you do it so well and you do it graciously as well. So thank you for leaning into your role here at this church and leaning to what God has called you into. Steve Scudder, the man with the graphic tees that didn't have a graphic tee this morning. Um, I think you, you know, you've said this before, you had no idea what you were getting into when you signed up for this role and becoming a resident here at this church. And for those who have just started attending or have been here for a while, you all know that we really haven't had a youth ministry up until this, uh, this past couple of years. Um, it's been a lot of great efforts to get it going, just never happened. And then Steve came in as a resident and started this youth program. And it's been incredible to see how God has worked through Steve and through this youth ministry to see the kids that are in there these days. And it's just a challenging world for these kids. There's a lot of things that are thrown at them each and every day. And the one thing that combats that is God's word and his truth. And it says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 through 17, every part of the scripture is God breathed and useful one way or another showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the task God has for us. Steve, you do a great job demonstrating just that to our youth, encourage them to engage with God's word um, and helping them have, uh, have their faith journey become their own. So thank you for all that you do in that, the way that you lean into what is God has called you into this church. I'm almost off the side here. <laughs> Parker Weirdo. This one's a lot of fun because he's my brother-in-law, if you didn't know that. Um, and just the just thank you for being such an awesome worship pastor. You know, we've talked about this a little bit, but back in May of 2023, we're at my other sister's wedding. And uh, we, we had joked with him and said, hey, we have this worship pastor position available. You should apply for it. He did apply for it, and through prayer and process, you know, he ended up here in Michigan and from Haiti and uh, moved up here with my sister. Um, and so we're just so grateful for how you leaned into that, how Abby has leaned into that, um, and just the way that you have grown in this role, how you have served in this role, and how you have led well and discipled intentionally. Um, you have such a heart for worship and leading people into God's presence and using your gifts. And you've tackled challenges that have come your way. There's a lot of work that goes into this every Sunday, the lights, the tech, the scheduling, the coordinating, working through songs. It's not just picking songs. It's picking songs that go with the sermons that 
best fit the group and everything like that. So there's just a lot that goes into that. And so thank you uh, for all that you do. And thank you for the servant heart. And thank you for leaning into what God has called you into in this season. <laughs> Kyle, last but not least, uh, I was going to make a joke about his tight t-shirts, but he wore a properly fitted shirt today. So <laughs> I, he makes fun of my bald head and my food choices. So it's all fun and fair game. So, <laughs> um, but it's hard to believe that it's almost been six years. It'll be six years next month that you took the call to the story to become the lead pastor here. And it was your first lead pastor role as well. Um, and just to say you are incredibly gifted in this. I know you had a lot of unknowns coming into this. I know that it was a yes before how type of situation. You were like, how am I going to do this? But the Lord has gifted you and you've leaned into that as well. And you've led this church through a lot of different seasons, a lot of unknowns, a lot of, uh, we had COVID happen. Um, it's just been a lot. And the one thing that you've reiterated time and time again is to keep leaning into what God's going to do and uh, sowing or reaping or sowing those seeds. And uh, now we're reaping those seeds and just that constant reminder of that. Um, and, and you set that tone for our church, and it says in Jeremiah 3, verse 15 says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. And I think that verse reflects how you have led. Um, you are after God's own heart, and you lead with knowledge and understanding. And even the things that you don't know, uh, you reach out, you ask questions, you're willing to get other people involved, which is another type of knowledge and understanding. And there's just a lot of work that you do behind the scenes as well, and the way that you lead your staff, the way that um, there's so many different things that go on in this church behind the scenes that probably a lot of people don't know about. So just thank you for the way that you've stepped into your call and leaning into what God has called you in this church in this season. So thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause to all four of these. Now we're going to take a moment to just pray over them. So if you could extend your hand for just a time of blessing for this leadership right here. So Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for just the blessing of this, these four people up here on the stage. We thank you for calling them here to the story. We thank you for the ways that you have used them to further your kingdom and children's ministry and youth ministry and worship ministry and just overall shepherding of the church, Lord. So we just pray a blessing over them. We pray a blessing over their families, their spouses. We pray that uh, your presence would go before them. Your presence would be with them each and every day as they walk with you, Lord. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Uh, after the service, there's, you may see there are four boxes in the lounge. Uh, we're going to keep those boxes up for the rest of... No, they can keep them, right? Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, <sorry. laughs> um, there's, uh, there's four boxes in the back. These are... Uh, you can write little notes of encouragement, of appreciation to them right here. We're going to keep that up through the end of the month. Um, and there also... There's cake afterwards. So dig in. We got lots of cake. And uh, it's Costco cake, too. It's even better. So there we go. All right, well, I'm going to pass it off to Sarah Van Mittendorp. Well, thank you again, Zach. Um, like he said, I'm Sarah. I'm the children's ministry director here. Um, so if you don't know me or you don't know some of our staff up here, maybe you're new, and we want to welcome you here today. Um, thank you so much for being here. We're glad you joined us. And if you're watching online, we're glad you're watching, and we hope that God will bless this time as we do our service together. Um, and so if you are new here, or maybe you have a new phone number or new address to update in our um, system, if you would fill out our connection card. Um, so that just lets us know who you are and that you came. And it allows us to um, connect with you and just keep you plugged in on what's going on in our church, maybe some upcoming events. So um, one of those upcoming events is our trunk or treat. So we host that around Halloween time. So this year it will be October 26th from 2 to 4 p.m. And so I have a few individuals in the church who have been helping me for actually a couple of months just getting plans together and getting things ready to make it a really fun event, but we really still need all of you. So if you are available that day, you have a car or a truck that you want to come and decorate and hand out candy or treats to our community, um, it's a great opportunity for us to invite our community here um, outside in our parking lot and like... Last week, we prayed for the 55% in our small community who do not have a relationship with God. In this trunk or treat, yes, it is fun, it is candy and treats, but it's more than that. It's more about an opportunity for us to invite those from our surrounding community to be a part of what we have going on here. And it's not coming into the church for a service, which maybe they are not willing to do yet, but if you show up and you hand out treats and you're a smiling face and a friendly person to them, you are representing this church to the community around us. And so I just ask if you're willing to come in that day um, for a couple of hours and hand out treats and be a smiling face to our community. Um, and if you are not able to be here that day, but you still would like to give, um, we have opportunities to take donations of candy 
or even little trinkets like bouncy balls, slap bracelets, fidget toys, things like that we can hand out to kids. Um, we can take those donations in the lounge and I will be able to collect them throughout the next couple of weeks before the event. Um, so you can sign up for that if you're interested online or like I said, bring donations here to the church. Um, and that brings us to our time of giving. Um, if you have a tithe or an offering, cash or check that we, you would like to give today, we have giving boxes at the exits of our church. Um, we also have online giving, so if you want to scan QR codes or go onto our website, um, whether that's a one-time gift or you want to make this a part of the rhythm of your life to give recurring gifts, um, you can set that up online. Um, and so we do this every week. It's an opportunity for us to just say to God that we trust him. We know that his, our security is in him. Instead of taking what he's given us and holding tightly and saying this money is my security, we open our hands up. We give back in obedience to God. We give back to the church, and we let him work through it. We let him grow the church, grow his kingdom with that. And so let's just take a moment to pray for our giving this morning in our service. God, <clears throat> thank you so much for the blessings that you pour out on us individually, on our families, on this church. God, we know that everything we have comes from you, and we just praise you for that. And I pray for Kyle this morning as he comes forward to bring the word that you will speak through him, you will work in our lives and in our communities and in our work in our families. Amen. And now I know we asked you to sit down, but I'm going to ask you again to stand up. And Kyle always says, I don't care if I make you uncomfortable. But for me, it's more like I want to encourage you to step out of your comfort zone. Because I think when you get out of your comfort zone and you lean into the spirit, that is when God really can work in you and move through you. So if you would stand with me this morning, um, our prayer focus today is children. And so we have a couple of children who are going to come up to the front. Um, and they're going to stand right here in front of the stage. And us as a church, this is an opportunity for us all together to pray over these children. So I invite you now, I'll give it in a moment, to extend hands over these kids. Pray prayers out loud over these kids. It doesn't matter if someone around you hears you because God hears you. He knows your requests. He hears each of our prayers for them. And if you would like to, you can recite scripture over them as you feel led. So let's take a moment right now and just pray for these children. Psalm 121.8 says, The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. God, that is my prayer this morning. For the kids who are here in our ministry, Lord, that you will watch over them. <clears throat> Be with them today as they learn more about your love, about your word, about your truth. Set their feet strong on the foundation of your truth. God, as they are surrounded by lies of this world, that you will stand them firm in your word and your truth. God, protect them spiritually. Protect them physically. Be with their families and their friends. Be with them as they go to school, as they go to church, as they go to the store or the playground. Lord, you see them and you watch over them. Thank you, God, for these children this morning. Amen. Oh, what a cool morning it's been already. If you don't know, uh, starting last week, um, we've been doing a pre-service prayer time 
uh, just in this room. And it's for anybody. It's open to anybody. Um, and it's just a time to come and pray with one another, pray over somebody if you're seeking prayer yourself. Um, but this morning as we were sitting in that meeting, um, I was just praying for just something new and something fresh in this place. I don't know about you, but over the past few weeks, it's, it's definitely felt that way. There's been a stirring in this room. There's been something new, and it's really exciting to be a part of. But as I invite you back into this moment of worship, um, I invite you to just think about what it means to sit in God's presence this morning. My prayer is that when you come into this room on a Sunday, it's not something that's uh, transactional. You're not coming here to seek something for yourself, but you're coming here to offer yourself in this time of worship, um, to come before God and offer yourself in this place this morning, uh, and not just coming seeking something for yourself, but coming to offer something this morning. And so as we, as we worship, we're going to worship in the truth of um, just resting in God's presence this morning, and that's my prayer over you. Nothing else will do 
wanna sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never wanna leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessing. You don't know me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. prayer this morning. Lord, as we worship you, may it be pleasing to you this morning. Father, we come seeking nothing for ourselves, but we surrender to you here in this place. Father, just make your presence known in this room and amongst your people. And even as we leave this building, Father, just make your presence known amongst this community. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Good morning. <clears throat> Today we kick off a brand new series. And uh, as you can see by the graphic, Everyday Influencers. Everyday Influencers. I, I started to remember the first time that uh, I, I remember when I got Instagram for the first time. Does I, who has Instagram in here? Raise your hand nice and high. Okay. Okay. Keep it up. Keep it up. Hang on. Okay. How many of us on Instagram have the blue check mark that makes you an official influencer? I don't either. Um, <clears throat> and here's what's interesting about that, right? Like, I remember that was like the goal always, right? You wanted to have that blue check because you wanted people to follow you, and, and it meant something. It meant this, like, status. 
it meant that you were essentially in some ways like worth following. I think there's maybe something in that for each and every one of us though. See, our world says like you need this check mark to be an influencer, but I would argue that what if, what if each and every one of us are influencers every single day in the places that we are? That's what I want to talk about. That's what this whole series is about. And it started to get me going down this rabbit hole, this, this trail of starting to think about certain brands. How many of you guys would remember these brands? I'm, Kodak. Anybody remember Kodak? Yeah. Okay, okay. That's good. That's good. What about Nokia, right? Like there are some of us that our first cell phone was the brick, phone of Nokia. It was massive. You could run that thing over with a tank and it still would function. I I swear by that. What about, how many of you guys remember Blockbuster? Does anybody still have their Blockbuster card? I know, right? Okay. Last one. Last one. The Sony, (laughs) the Sony Walkman. Who remembers the Sony Walkman? What do all four of these companies have in common though? All four of these companies missed the shift culturally in their times. They missed it. Kodak. Kodak was actually the very first company to develop the digital camera. First one to ever manufacture and make it. But they were so caught up in how things always have been of the role of film and then you have to get it developed and everything that even though they developed the digital camera, the first one of making the digital camera, They were so focused on how everything always was and always, quote, quote, should be, that they never fully bought into the digital camera era. Kodak went bankrupt in 2012. For some of us, we remember Nokia. Nokia, the big joke always is that, yes, like it was this monstrous phone and it always would function no matter if you threw it up against a brick wall, ran over it with a tank, no matter what, it always functioned. But many of us maybe didn't know that Nokia actually developed the very first cellular network. So here this is, this company, they create the first cellular network and they know that there's a movement coming, a shift coming, the smartphone era, but they overestimated their brand. They said, yeah, 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 that's good, but that's just a fad. People actually don't want to be accessible all the time with email and everything. So we're not going to fully go into that. And if we have to, our brand is that good that we'll just catch up. 2008, one year after the iPhone came out, Nokia was already far too late. How many of you guys currently right now have access to the Bible app on your Nokia phone in your pocket? I didn't think so. Blockbuster. Blockbuster. In the heyday, Blockbuster was the place to go like on Friday night, right? You'd pack the kids up and maybe you were like my mom and we were all getting in the car and then we unload and it was like, okay, you keep your hands in your pocket. (laughs) No, we're not getting any candy. No, we're only getting one movie and you all must decide on the movie. And outside of that movie, we're not getting any thing else, right? Because this was like, it was like the doors open and it was almost like a glimpse of heaven. It was like, oh, and you're like, this is amazing, right? And there's aisles upon aisles upon aisles of DVDs. Maybe you were around for VHSs, but DVDs. And you're like, this is awesome. And then you stand in line, what felt like forever. And then you have to return it after so many days. How many of you were like me and my family who forgot to return them? And you get hit with that $45 a day late fee, basically, right? You're like, dude, I just bought the movie five times. Blockbuster, though, they were so believing that nobody actually would do anything besides go to their stores and rent a DVD. There's a moment where somebody came up with this radical, crazy idea that people would actually rather go on their their phones or their internet and rent a DVD and then have it mailed to them in like two days. And they'd rather... Like that was the shift. And somebody was like, I think this is going to be great. Like 
They can go on, they can get it mailed to them, they can watch it, and then they just put it back in the mailbox and it comes back to us and they get another one. Did you know that they came to Blockbuster and said, hey, I have this idea, I'll sell you this idea. And Blockbuster goes, that's the dumbest idea in the world. We're not doing it. You guys know what that company is now? Netflix. Netflix. Blockbuster had the opportunity to buy Netflix before Netflix was Netflix. And they said, that is the dumbest idea in the world. There's one Blockbuster in the world that still is open. And it's in Oregon. One Blockbuster. How many of you use Netflix? Miss the shift. The Sony Walkman revolutionize this idea of how we can take audio with us, music with us. For some of us, you start out with like the cassette. Others of us have the CD player and you couldn't walk too fast or jog because it actually would still skip. And so you're like, suppose we run it, right? And you're like, oh, I got to slow down. You're like you're defeating the purpose, Sony. But we thought it was the coolest thing in the world, right? It revolutionized it. Did you know that Sony the Sony Walkman had not just all the technology, but all the resources to create a better product than the iPod. But they said, no, we don't need to do that. We're too scared that it might fail. So they never created it. What about one more brand? Can we do one more? I think there's, uh, we're in, I think that in today's day and age, there could be one more that is on the verge of potentially missing the shift culturally. The church. The church. Hear me on this. Before you're like, oh my goodness, God has gone full crazy. Partial, not full yet. Are we soon to be added to the list of the missing of the shift? See, all of those companies had great plans. They had a great mission and vision strategy. They understood where they were going. They understood what they were doing, but yet they missed the cultural shifts that were happening. What happens if we do the same? The church has always been God's plan A. It's from the very beginning, like God's plan A was the church, his people. And, and I'm not suggesting that the message changed. The message has been the, the most powerful, life-transforming message this world has ever known. That God would see the hot mess express of the world and send his only son into this world to die for us, to be buried in a grave, rise again three days later and send his Holy Spirit to us. That message is eternal. I'm not suggesting by any means that his message has to change. But I do believe that if we're not aware of some of the shifts happening and we're so stuck in, well, this is the way church has always been, or this is the model it always has to look like, we may miss the shift and miss an opportunity to bring people into the kingdom and into the presence of God. And I don't know about you, but as much as I pray, God, would you come? Yesterday would have been a great day. There's still people in my lives that I'm like, but hold up, let me talk to them first. Because I don't want to be in heaven if they're not there too. Because I'm praying for them. And I want them there. Are we on the cusp of missing a shift? Rich Villados, he puts it this way. We don't build the kingdom of God. We announce it. We seek it. We receive it. We bear witness to it. We build for it. The king builds the kingdom. We're just the big mouthpieces. And that's where I want to kind of start digging in today. If you guys have your Bible with you, if you have your phone with you, whatever it is, would you turn to, I want to give you a little bit of moments here, Acts chapter 2. For some of us, if you grew up in the church, you know that this is the, the moment where, where the Holy Spirit flows down from heaven and it starts to transform and, and it fills the early disciples and, and the apostles with his spirit. And here we get this moment where as we're digging into this, Peter is standing and preaching after being filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's this radical and pivotal moment, not just in his life, but it's about to trigger a movement in the whole entire culture. 
We see him and others being gathered and he's preaching. And, and as Peter is doing this, he's doing his best to help the followers of Christ to remember what Jesus said. Like Jesus has called you to be the salt and light of the earth. And so what Peter is not going to do is he's not going to sugarcoat the gospel because you can't be salty if you're too sweet. Okay. So here he is and he's going. And this is what he says. Acts chapter two, verse 38 through 43. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for your forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accept his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So they devoted themselves, they were steadfast to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So here Peter is, gets up and he's preaching his heart out. And it says that people are being transformed, people are being added to their number. And they ask like, okay, so Peter, what should we do? And his, his answer is, is very simple, right? Repent. Turn away from your evil ways. Turn away from your sinful lifestyle. Turn away from the things that this world has always been doing and turn back to God. And once you do that, he says, then go and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, your Savior. So repent, be baptized, What's intriguing is that this is not this far off concept for his audience at the time, the Jewish people at the time. Repent, yeah, we understand that. But then he instructs them to also be baptized. Baptism back in that day would have been a different idea or even concept for the Jews. Why? Because they are God's people. So baptism would be essentially in some ways reserved for the Gentiles, those other people who are trying to become Jewish and that's how they would do it. But here Peter is, he's like, no, 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 no. You're missing it. Everybody, everybody needs to get repenting and be baptized. He's like, this is for you. This is for me. This is for all of us. Repent and be baptized. And so here they are, they're gathering together and don't miss this. It says that the Jews who are gathering as he's preaching are steadfast. They're steadfast. They were devoted Devoted in their doctrine, devoted in their fellowship, devoted in observing the Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread together, and devoted in prayer. They gathered. But you have to imagine that as Peter is preaching and everybody is there gathered together, there's a moment where there's a realization that somebody's missing. See, they're gathering in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is is located in the heart of Israel. It's located right there where the temple is located. The church is being birthed out of Jerusalem. Jesus rises from the dead here. The Holy Spirit is descending upon them here in the upper room. Jerusalem is the heart where everybody was gathering. But there's another place that God wanted to do something different. He wanted to make a shift. About 300 miles away from Jerusalem is this intersecting point for tons of roads, Antioch. As Jerusalem is the place where everybody is gathering, God is stirring and doing something new in the church in Antioch, something different, something actually very radical for them at their time. This is what it says. If you flip ahead a couple of chapters, Acts chapter 13. 1 through 3, this is what it says in Acts 13. Now in the church at Antioch, there are different prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manan, and they've all, and then Saul. And as they're standing there, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. 
And after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them, Barnabas and Saul, and they sent them off. God says, I have a special work, a special mission and call for these two men. And so here's what I need you to do. I need you to place your hands on them, commission them, and send them out. This is different than what the church has looked like just a few chapters before. How they did things is not like this. You have to remember Jerusalem here is a place where everybody gathers. Hey, go and tell your people to come and hang out with us here. Come and be here with us. Come and hear about the scriptures. Come and do this. Come, come, come. It's all about coming to the church in Jerusalem. But then there's this moment in Antioch where they say, there's something different. There's a shift happening and it's no longer, hey, come and and see, come and taste and see. It's go. You're sent out. There's a radical shift that is happening in the church in Antioch that would be a very different mindset for the church in Jerusalem because things are changing. Change makes us uncomfortable. And I think that it's so uncomfortable for so many different reasons. But I think if you look at different shifts or different changes in your life that you are uncomfortable, I think there's usually four markers. The first marker is this, and and I should have put them up on the screen. It's totally on me. I didn't. But listen carefully, and I'm going to share them, and then I'm going to go one by one and kind of expound upon them. Sound good? So the first one is this, the landscape changes with forces outside of our own control. When, when things are happening, the landscape changes, especially with forces outside of our own control. There's also moments, even in this text, in this church of Antioch, and comparing it to Jerusalem, where, where God is moving in places and in ways that are unfamiliar to us. When God works in different ways that are unfamiliar to us. And when that happens, when the landscape changes and God works in ways that are unfamiliar to us, it causes us this lovely thing called anxiety, stress, confusion, and frustration, not just personally, but also in the organization. And as we're left to think about all of this thing, the fourth one is is it leads us to a place of what do we do now? Well, it invites us into a moment in a posture of discernment discernment. What does this look like for us? The landscape is shifting. If you've been living under a rock, maybe you haven't seen how the landscape is shifting culturally. But the landscape is drastically shifting. In recent surveys, almost 80% of people surveyed would not come to a pastor for any type of counseling or life crisis in their lives. 80% said, I'm not going to go to any type of pastor or religious leader. I'll go to some outside source. Why would that be? Probably because 36% of Americans would rate pastors as having high ethical standards or honest even. 36%. It's a historic low, by the way. I, I know that as a pastor, I'm not immune to seeing the headlines of scandal after scandal after scandal. Failure after failure after failure from pastor and religious leader. Whether it be sexual immorality, whether it be moral failures, whether it be narcissism driving them to the core, scandal and failure after failure, 36% of Americans would look at the profession of a pastor and say they do not have high ethical standards or even honest. 31% of those people would also say that the church is actually a source of wisdom. Think about that. 31% of Americans would say that God's word or even his church is a source of wisdom. That means almost 70% would argue that the church is not a place of wisdom or knowledge. I have people in my life who would say the church has become more or less a place of these High, lofty, warm, fuzzy feelings that are far off but never really achievable. It's not a place for wisdom, Kyle. 
the culture and the landscape is shifting. On average, a regular attender in America shows up to church 1.75 times a month. Some of us are sitting here and you're like, yes, overachiever, I show up twice a month. <laughs> Bam! Right? Others of us are like, crap. I don't know how you measure 0.75 times, by the way. Does that mean you like shut the laptop after, you know, I'm done preaching? And you're like, I got three-fourths of the way in. We're good to go. Is that we leave early? I don't, I don't know what 0.75 looks like. But what I do know is that the landscape is changing. The landscape is shifting. And it has been shifting. I mean, the label, the identity of a Christian has been hijacked and politicized. It means certain things for both sides of the table right now. It means certain costs if you identify even as a Christian. The reputation you have in circles, if people know about your faith, or even the assumptions of who you, let's just be honest, really are, there's a social cost. The landscape is shifting from what used to be so normal, the family unit getting up on Sunday morning and getting dressed and showing up to church and being actively involved in the church to now it's shifting to it's becoming very optional. It's becoming just an option, maybe even just a simple checkbox. What used to be normal to just attend is now being quiet, staying home, or maybe not even at all. It's shifting from being a place where people with all their hurts and hangups and brokenness and messiness of life can show up and be accepted and welcomed to a place where you're sitting in my seat. Why are you here? It's shifting from a place of, well, I didn't like that new song that Parker sang. I'm out. I can't tell you how many times where I've gotten in different settings. Man, you know, Kyle, I just didn't like the worship service. Say, it's a good thing we're not worshiping you today then, right? It's a good thing we're not worshiping you. The landscape has been shifting. And maybe you're sitting here and you're like, dang, Kyle, it's a nice light sermon today. I got good news for you. It's not going to get lighter. Because the landscape is shifting. And here's why it's shifting. Because God is doing things in different ways than what we've seen or encountered or are even comfortable with. He's moving. Point in case. On the 2023 National Championship of the uh, NCAA football team, the University of Michigan, um, 70 players got baptized last year in the course of their season. 70 players. We're talking about guys, teens, college students who are showing up and they're influenced. Do you remember what college campuses used to be like for you? The temptation is rampant. Everything is just in their face. And yet here these young men are and they show up and they're competing for a football championship. But before they do that, their, desi their desire is, I have to put my faith and trust in Jesus first. They baptized over half of their roster last year. And maybe for some of us, we're sitting here and you're like, okay, but that, whatever. That's sweet, cool. Like, I, I, I truly believe there's a movement and a shift happening. And if the church doesn't recognize it, we may miss the boat on hundreds, if not thousands of people who God wants to invite us to participate and walk with them and invite them into the kingdom of God. We proclaim it. And as we're sitting here and you're like, okay, but like, does God really go to places that are unimaginable and do this? Absolutely. Point in case, this year, this year, God is moving in an absolute place that I thought there's no way God would move Columbus, Ohio at the Ohio State University, <laughs> where their football team is hosting prayer and baptism and worship services. 2,000 students skipped class on a Friday to join with the football team, 300 plus pound linemen leading worship and baptizing 100 people at this Friday service. They're, they're showing up to games and they're wearing shirts that just say Jesus won underneath their jerseys. They're taking off their jerseys after wins and they're giving glory and honor to God. Tell me again that God isn't working in places unimaginable to mankind. 
I'm telling you. But it's so interesting to me as I sit here thinking to myself, we're so hard on people. I mean, we see celebrities professing their faith and their allegiance and their hope to Jesus Christ, but yet there's things in their lives that haven't changed fully yet. And so we're like, there's no way they're actually authentic about that. There's no way they could be. We forget, we forget that we're works in progress. I'm a work in progress. Like, did everything change in your life the very moment you accepted Jesus into your life and everything, all the bad things that you've ever done in your life disappear? (laughs) At least for me, the temptation was still there. The brokenness in my life was still there. I had to still figure out stuff with God's help and his leading. But yet we look at people and we're like, oh man, they done did, did it again. People be peopling. Like, I heard that this past week, and I was like, that is the best quote I've ever, people be peopling. I'm like, yes, people be peopling. And and like, how often do we forget that we are works in progress, that God is working in ways that are unfamiliar or different than what we can see, and it makes us uncomfortable, because ultimately, we think we're incapable, we're unqualified, we, we can't be used by God, I'm still a hot mess, So what is happening in this world, in this shift is things are moving from being just secular and just sacred to there's this beautiful like blending of secular and sacred and we're caught in it and we're like, that's messy. (laughs) And it is. And I love it. I love it. Because in that mess, it leads us to a place where we become anxious, confused, frustrated, and so many other things. So many other things. It makes us anxious because we're looking at these people. I I look at these college students right now, and the first thought that sometimes comes into mind is, can we trust them? Like, can I trust a running back? to lead somebody to Jesus. He has no degree. He has no training. (laughs) Like this dude's job on Saturday morning is to run through people. Can I trust him to lead people to the kingdom of God? Are we crazy? But, But here's a kicker, right? Like we have all this anxiety because it's the same anxiety that the church felt with Antioch doing their new model. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out, time out, time out, whoa. You're sending them out? Did they pass the ordination test? Did you make them go through systematic theology 101 and 102? Do they understand the creeds and the doctrines and the theology that we're asking them to go in? And here's what the best part about this. The church is like, (laughs) I don't know, but we're sending them out. And here's what we're doing. We're telling them to preach the gospel and baptizing people. Like it's very simple. The shift that was going on was very simple. It went from come to let's go. Are we next on the list though? Are we next on the list? Are we too scared that if we let untrained, unordained people go and preach the gospel and baptizing people, isn't that what the the quote, quote, professionals are for, Kyle? Like, isn't that your job? How do, we, how do we do this? It comes down to one thing, discernment. Discernment. That's where we're at today. Discernment. Go on and look at the recent studies. You can Google it. You can find it. It's very easy. The church is in decline in the West. Outside of two or three main big denominations, the church is in decline. Major denominations, major, major organizations in decline. Why? Well, this is how we've always done church and this is how we're always going to do church. Fit in. 
It's essentially the question for us to discern. Are we going to get really good at managing the decline, trying to manipulate the numbers to make us feel all warm and fuzzy and good? Are we going to be okay with discerning what God is inviting us into? That's where we're at today. Are we next on the list of missing the shift? Because it starts with us realizing something that is so profound. God is with you wherever you go. We've said it, we've sang it, we, we, we are like, oh yeah, no. Obviously, Kyle, duh. Yeah, but like how often do we forget that? Like God is with you wherever you go. As you're driving home today, God is with you. As you show up to your workplace on Monday morning, God is with you. If you go through the drive through at Starbucks, God is with you. We forget this truth that God is with you. And if God is with you, why do we not actively join in the journey of participation? Listen, I'm not asking you to change anything in your life. I'm not asking you to change your diet. I'm not asking you to start a new group. I'm not asking you to get like new tattoos or whatever. If you are getting a new tattoo, I'd love to go with you though. But listen, I'm not asking you to do any of that. All I'm asking you to do is take Jesus with you. Without shame, without guilt, take Jesus with you. Wherever you may go. Wherever you may go because we have to move. We have to make the shift from this attractional Jerusalem model, come, 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 to the model of Antioch of go, preach the good news. And hear me on this, hear me on this. Preach repentance and baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those stories of people taking that seriously. College students baptizing their friends at 2 a.m. at a college campus in a fountain as security is standing there being like, you can't do this. And it's like 250, 300 college students are like, we don't care. There's water, we're baptizing people, who's in? That's what the gospel is about. Like, go and preach the good news and baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Take him with you everywhere you go. We have to move from this feel-good Jerusalem family camp. We're all in this together. This is so much fun. Oh my goodness, warm fuzzies. To this idea of what Antioch was, which was boot camp. We're going to prepare you. (laughs) We're going to give you the tools. I'll teach you what you need to do. That's essentially what Paul and Barnabas were saying. I'll I'll show you. I'll I'll teach you what I've learned. And then we're kicking you out the door. You have a, there's a plan in place. But you're going to go. You're not going to stay here. This is part one of a part two, uh, of a two-part series. It's very intentional. Because I think part one, this day, it sucks to hear that we have a problem. But there is good news. The good news is this. There's a solution. And you get that next week. Get that next week. So as we conclude today, here's what I want to invite you into. I want to invite you into a moment of discernment. The question I want you and I to discern individually and collectively as a church is where is God? Where is God inviting you to discern and be willing to obey? For some of us, that might be our workplace. For some of us, that might be our neighborhood. Let's just call it what it is. There's others of us in this room today watching online that you are sitting here and you're like, God, please do not invite me to go and do this to my very own family. But that's exactly where he wants you to go. So during this next song, would you just take a moment and ask for his discernment, his wisdom, his knowledge to lead you and then the boldness to go and obey. Would you pray with me? 
Father, as we come before you, we simply ask for your Holy Spirit to fall fresh. In the name of the Holy Spirit, we ask for the distractions of this world to be blocked out and that you would so tune our ears and our hearts to your voice that it would be the only thing that we can hear today. Give us discernment, Lord. Give us your knowledge and your wisdom of what you are inviting us into. We ask that your Holy Spirit would come, it would fall fresh, that nothing in this world would satisfy us but you. So God, we give it to you. And we ask this in your name. And we ask, Holy Spirit, come. than anything that last line I just want you what would it look like to take Jesus with you in every single aspect of your life a radical shift 
different than ways we've done before. But that invite is there. This week, as you discern where and how God is inviting you into that, maybe you just need to keep asking that, God, where are you inviting me into? Who are you inviting me to? And how do you want me to do it? And I fully trust and believe that God is faithful and he will speak that answer to you. Like I said, this is a part one of a part two of a two-part sermon. So I, I hope you come back next week. I hope you come back because there is a solution. And let me tell you, it's a good one. I love y'all and I'll see you guys next week.